be here. Um, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about my career journey just because I can then share some stories rather than just give you stats and numbers around inclusivity. This is going to work. I'm starting with a really embarrassing photo. Um, so that's me on my mum's lap with my three brothers. Um, we all look the same with a bad haircut. Um, but I, I show that story just because it helps explain a little bit about why I ended up in the job that I'm in. You know when you're growing up and people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? For me, it was always to be a vet. I never, ever varied. I think there was one day I decided I was going to be a Nobel Prize winner. Um, but other than that, I always wanted to be a vet. So I had selected all of my su subjects around going to vet school, which in those days I was going to have to go interstate. We didn't have the fabulous Roseworthy College, so I was going to go to, to Perth. And then this thing hit that I call my adolescent reality, which is I'd always known that I'm really squeamish. I faint when I see blood or needles or anything like that. And I thought I would grow out of it. And I think it was in about the start of year 12 I realised I wasn't going to grow out of it. And so I obviously couldn't be a vet. It's not much of a career trait for a vet. So I went to university doing a science degree because I'd selected all my subjects about um, science because that's what you had to do to be a vet. And it was just before the, the second term exams that I realised I don't want to be a scientist. So I dropped out. So I was a uni dropout and got a job in a bank because in those days, and we are going back quite some time, um, I ended up working in a bank which in those days looked a little bit like that. Now, there's a number of young, younger people in the audience here. You probably can't remember the days when you just openly smoked in an office, uh, but you did. Uh, I worked in a, in a bank branch that didn't actually have a female toilet. And I remember vividly having the discussion. I'd grown up with three brothers, so I was always you know, quite comfortable challenging the norm. And I was never treated any differently by my parents. Luckily, there was the, the focus on education, et cetera, and, and do as much as you can and be whatever you can be. But then I joined an organisation where um, the women were tellers and that was about it. You didn't do anything else. Uh, if you got married, you had to get the permission from your husband to keep working. And it's really scary when you look back and remember some of those things we have come a long way, Rebecca. There's, there's still a long way to go, but we have come a long way. I remember having the conversation um, with the, the other staff at the branch saying, you know, there is a toilet in this branch. It's got a lock. So maybe when you're in it, it's a male toilet. And when I go in it, it's a female toilet. No biggie. They couldn't get their head around that. So I had to walk down the road and go to the newsagent toilet out the back. There was certainly no concept of females in management. Um, I was very, very fortunate that um, when I returned from maternity leave, uh, I was offered a position by the then state manager to be a project director. Now, I was, number one, the first female to return to a role that was anything other than a part-time teller because they just didn't, you just didn't, didn't happen those days. And I, if I'd looked at the job description for that job, there wasn't one. If there had been one, I think I probably could have done about 10% of it. I learnt more in the two years in that job than I've learnt probably if I'd stayed on a career path for 10 years in the bank. And looking back and saying, you know, what was it? It was something really special about the state manager at the time for having enough courage to appoint someone who he just saw potential in. And I think that's the biggest message we can give about an inclusive, diverse workforce is you know, I'd like to think of Peter was absolutely career changing for me by having the courage to make that appointment. Have I done that for other people? Have I created those opportunities for other people? And I think the public sector, and I remember having this conversation many times when I moved from the private sector into to government, I think our recruitment processes uh, sometimes make diversity and challenge and inclusivity more complex and challenging than they should be. You know, we should all be taking the opportunity to see people and tap them on the shoulder, give them opportunities, support them, help them grow. I said I learnt more in that two years than I ever would have. So what are we doing to help other people who may not have those opportunities? Uh, so the role, some might call it a mentor. We didn't call it mentors then. Uh, but that's really what Peter was for me. 
And it was interesting, I, I uh, caught up with him years later. You do have to also, though, remember, this was at a time, I mean, my, my husband at the time, luckily he's got a fabulous sense of humour, um, he got invited to things like, he got a, a letter, it was a mail merge done on Word Perfect in those days, inviting him to attend the wives' day because the bank had never had a female executive and they used to have an annual strategic planning session and all the executives would get together and work and then the partners would be invited and we'd have a nice dinner. So Pete got invited to the wife's shopping day and he thought it was a hoot because they all looked after him and he, th he thought it was great. Um, but he also did have phone calls at our home address saying, oh, you know your wife must be sleeping with the boss. And I said, we... We've been married now 35 years. He's, uh, he's obviously you know, mature enough to cope with that. But I would hope that that doesn't happen in this day and age. When you read some of the stories in some industry sectors, it probably still does happen. Um, and again, that's up to each and every one of us to make sure that it doesn't and that we call it out if it does. Because you know, that old saying of this, the, the behaviour you walk past is the, the behaviour that you're endorsing. So I spent it was going to be six months in the bank. That was my intent when I dropped out. I just was getting, getting a job to earn some money until I worked out what it was that I wanted to be and then I was going to go back to uni. Well, I stayed there 17 years, did all sorts of different jobs, uh, marketing, um, human resources, as well as the sort of banky stuff. So I was a bank manager for a, a little while and all my study was then done the hard way. So the key lessons I always encourage, and particularly younger people, but it applies at any age, is you do have to grab opportunities and be brave enough to take them. You know, if I'd really thought long and hard, that project director job, you know, I, I do remember going home every now and then saying, I really have no idea what I'm doing. And um, you, you learn through that. But you need people who can, as I said, tap people on the shoulder, encourage them to step over and above where they are currently. And you've got to keep learning. At the zoo, so I, I went from this very male-dominated uh, banking and finance sector. I went into local government for a little while and then into the state government. And as Rebecca has commented, I found it quite... Um, pleasant to be sitting in a room with quite a diverse uh, group, especially in further education. Education does tend to have a higher proportion of females. Um, so we had a, a fairly even mix. And the zoo uh, gender mix is, is pretty good. Our board has got a, a good gender mix. Our leadership team has. Now I'm just talking gender mix. Our leadership team has got quite a good age diversity, although my youngest director is, and I can no longer say I've got someone in their 30s because they just had their 40th birthday last week, so I'm <laughs> going to have to find someone young. Um, so we do have a reasonable age diversity. Um, we've got certainly a very diverse background. What we don't have yet is good cultural diversity, and that's something that both our board and our leadership team are still lacking. Uh, and our staff, it's shifting in the zoo industry. If you looked back 15 years, it was more of a male-dominated. Most of our animal carers now coming through are younger women. Uh, but it, it varies. Our veterinary team is quite balanced. Our research conservation is quite balanced. Our maintenance team is nearly all older men. Um, so we've got different pockets. One thing we do have at the zoo is um, quite diversity in regard to um, different sexual orientations. So, and I've often wondered, is that because we're a more open workplace um, that it's, it's, it's celebrated, then no one hides it. We, we hosted the Feast Festival launch and had fabulous drag queens doing tours around the zoo, which talking about the sexual habits of animals was, you know. <laughs> so we've got some diversity, but cultural diversity is one that we're missing. The other one I, I often show this to, to people, and I, I think it's some people look at others and think, oh, you've always had this nice smooth career path and it's the only way is up, and the reality is that's not at all. You have, even in a day, you can have ups and downs. And I think, again, as leaders, we need to let people know that that's the norm and that's okay, and you just pick yourself up and, and move on. Um, again, unfortunately, I think in the, in the public sector sometimes there can be if something goes wrong, everybody focuses on the what went wrong rather than, well, yeah, it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to do. What do we learn from that? How do we move forward? Um, which is what we like to try and drive in, at the zoo. Um, we use this thing when we train our animals called positive reinforcement. So you, you, you work out, because we train out all our animals for health checks, etc. It works for people. So when we're talking about driving behaviour change, to me it's as simple as really working out what behaviour you want and then rewarding people when you see it. So if you want an inclusive workforce, if 
that's one of the things. We, we went through the zoo and said, what are the things we want? What, it, what is the behaviour that you want to see? Define it, think about it, practice it and reward it. And the reward doesn't, with our animals, it's food. It might be just acknowledging and giving some praise to, to a manager who you've seen putting something in place in the workforce. And I'm going to finish with this very quick story. Um, our daughter is now 28. She moved to London. And you can imagine being brought up in our household. She never had any of this view of what women do and what men do. Like, I can't iron and I never shop. My husband went away for three weeks and we ran out of, I ran out of food, ran out of toilet paper because he does all of that stuff. So our daughter grew up feeling really confident, independent, moved to London. And she was telling me the story about just after she'd started a, a, a job there. She was in the kitchen making a cup of tea and she said it was a very friendly conversation, but someone asked her this question. Oh, so you've just moved from Australia. Did you come with your husband? What does he do? And she said he wasn't being rude. It's that whole unconscious bias thing. Because she said, if I was a 25-year-old male, would I have been asked that question? And yet the reality is there's just as much chance that she moved with or he moved with her, but it's not in people's headset. And, of course, this was my daughter's answer because she is an independent woman. She just said, no, just me, came by myself. I'm going to leave you with this as a little question to pose. This is our full mix at the zoo. Anyone got a hazard a guess? At Adelaide Zoo, it means of our total animals, we have 427 males, 467 females and 2,732 that are not yet sexed. <laughs> and at Monato Zoo, you'll see that that unsexed number is quite low. Uh, that's because at Adelaide, we've just, just that was just the audit from last month, and we just had a whole pile of fish and insects, and they <laughs> hadn't been sexed. So um, I always, it doesn't matter which audience I'm in, I always encourage people, the zoo is not a government zoo, we're a conservation charity. We rely on the support of South Australian communities, so please think about how you can help us. Fabulous time to be buying Christmas presents. Uh, and I've closed by a cute photo of a boy. So that's our latest little giraffe baby. And a cute photo of a girl. That's our latest little rhino baby. So thank you all. And sorry I can't stay for the panel, but I'll, I'll hopefully catch up with a few of you very quickly. Thanks.